Hey, good evening. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Gotti Schwartz coming to you from Los Angeles. And here's some of the stories we're watching tonight, starting with your money and how this debt ceiling deal could impact all of it. The futures have come up on this, but great. Show us the money. Show us the deal. And Republican sources are telling NBC News that they are getting closer to a deal. But has this back and forth on negotiations spooked the markets? NBC's Stephanie Rule helps me break it all down. Plus, outrage in Mississippi. An 11-year-old boy is shot by police after calling 911 for help. But his family is demanding in the wake of the tragedy. He have a lot of questions. He asked me in the hospital, like, why they shot him. Mankind versus Machine. The great showdown between thousands of human hackers versus AI is set to go down in the Wild West of Las Vegas. What could possibly go wrong? More ransomware, more uh, malware. We're going to get more disinformation. We're going to get more of these things. We need to build AI systems to detect those faster. We've been doing a lot of talking about the possibility of the U.S. going into default and how that could affect all of us in a massive way. Well, things just got even more dicey because a credit rating system is now saying that there's a chance that the U.S. might default on its debts, which is a huge red flag to investigators, uh, investors. And if you're like, what do you mean investors? This is the United States. This isn't some company. Well, you know how we all have a credit score? Some of us have debt. Others have dings on our credit. And then you have what's con considered a perfect score. Well, the U.S. basically has a perfect credit score, a triple A rating, because it always pays its debts. But this year, we have racked up about a trillion dollars more than we've brought in, and that has put our current total debt over the past years at around $31 trillion. So we have basically hit our credit card limit. And as it stands right now, if cuts are not made to next year's budget or we decide it's okay to go more in debt, then we risk default. And just like the rest of us, credit scores that determine how much interest you pay are at play here. And just like Equifax or TransUnion tracks us, those three agencies track countries, and they've got a rating system too. And now Fitch Ratings has placed the U.S. AAA status on what's called rating watch negative, warning that if things go south with this debt ceiling deal, they might downgrade us. We know what it means if we don't pay our credit card bill, but what does it mean for the most powerful economy in the world? That is way too big of a question just for me to wrap my mind around. So we're going to ask one of the smartest financial minds I know, NBC News senior business analyst Stephanie Rule joins us now. Uh, hi, Steph. So first off, tell us, why should the average American watching this right now at home thinking, OK, well, I, maybe I don't want to pay my credit card bill this year or this month. I'll, I'll take the ding on the next month. How does this pertain to the United States and, and what we could see in the next couple of months? Well, we don't ever want that to happen. Remember, this is not about a budget negotiation. The budget was set months ago. The debt ceiling is about paying the bills of things we have already spent. Now, when people are freaking out saying, hold on a second, Fitch is going to downgrade our AAA rating, which means everything will get more expensive. It'll be more expensive to borrow. I don't want people to freak out, and here's why because we haven't hit the date just yet. And Fitch is a rating agency, and what do they have to deal in right now, Gotti? Facts. And while things might change next week, things might change tomorrow, and they might have a deal, if you're the rating agency, you can't make a decision based on might next week, tomorrow, or next week. And the fact of the matter is, the clock is ticking, and right now, tonight, there is no deal. And they have to make a decision based on what they know right now. And they're under a lot of pressure to be extra tight about that because back in 2008, leading into the financial crisis, Fitch and the other rating agencies did not downgrade the United States, did not downgrade anything as we headed into a disastrous situation. So what we have in our hands right now is a warning. Though those I'm speaking to on both the Republican side and the Democratic side are saying, we know we're getting down to the wire. However, we are progressing along. You know, normally when you see the White House standing at the podium saying we're a mile apart or you see Kevin McCarthy, the Republican, saying nothing's happening, that is not good news. For the most part, over the last few days, they've been somewhat silent. And a source close to negotiations had said to me, silence means progress. And so you were just talking about 2008 and how, you know, we didn't see this uh, red flag before then. But then in 2011, during the Obama administration, uh, 
another agency still ended up downgrading the rating after a deal was reached, right? And then we saw like a pretty significant drop in the S&P. How did that play out? We did, and remember though, things recovered after that. And right now, the markets are a little bit sensitive. However, here's something to look very closely at. Given how close we are to this debt ceiling, and the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has said to us, we will not be able to pay for all of our services come the beginning of June, which is next week. You and I might think, well, why aren't the markets cratering? Why aren't they in free fall ahead of this? Well, remember, a lot of big, big investors are also big, big donors. And reporters like you and me are watching these negotiators in Congress come out of the building and we're trying to read the tea leaves and hoping somebody on their team leaks a little, little bit to us so we can understand what's going on in the room. But if you're a very big donor, Gotti, you get to call those Congress people. And there is a very good chance, my sources are telling me, that a Mitch McConnell, a Kevin McCarthy, their teams are speaking directly to some of the biggest investors and biggest bankers on Wall Street. And they sort of set the tone. And while they're not thrilled about this situation, if they thought we were really heading into default, you would see the markets taking a much more significant step down. So believe when you see the markets aren't moving much, they know a bit more than we do. I honestly, I just look at your face and you look pretty relaxed right now, uh, which is the, the biggest bellwether for me. So how do you see this playing out in the upcoming days based on the conversations that you've had? Listen, this is very, very stressful. We have seen this before. So a lot of people who are very seasoned in this have said, we've seen this lots of times before. The thing that gives me the most pause is that we've heard from certain members of Congress, from, from Kevin McCarthy's, uh, from people in the Freedom Caucus who have said, maybe we should default. Even the former president, Donald Trump, in a town hall a couple of weeks ago said, well, maybe we deserve it. We could default. So there is always the risk. What if somebody throws a monkey wrench into this? What if the White House, what if Republicans and Democrats come to agree an agreement and then something happens and they don't have the votes? So there is always that wild card that, that this might not come together. But from those I'm speaking to who have said, listen, this is the way the dance goes. This is how they get one side to negotiate with the other. Republicans want to get something out of this and Democrats want to hold the line. And they both have to put up a fight and put up a show to satisfy both of their parties. Stephanie Rule, thanks so much. We're going to stay tuned to all of your reporting. And Great you can catch you. more of Stephanie's brilliant analysis tonight. Must see TV and every weekend, our weekday night on the 11th hour with Stephanie Rule, 11 p.m. Eastern. So don't miss it. Thanks, Steph. Turning now to an 11-year-old boy who was allegedly shot by the Mississippi police. And here's what the family says happened. Uh, Adrian Moore was at home when police showed up after a 911 call. His mom called for help when the dad of one of her kids showed up angry. When police got there, they drew their guns and told everyone to get outside. An officer then allegedly shot the 11-year-old when he came into the living room after police say they told everyone to go outside. And the, today, the family and protesters are demanding accountability while the little boy is still recovering. The officer who allegedly fired the gun is on paid administrative leave. And joining us now is NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson. Uh, first off, uh, how's he doing? Yeah, this is miraculous, Scotty. Imagine that kid comes to the door. He is, according to family, met by gunfire. He shot one time in the chest. He's got a collapsed lung, a lacerated liver, several broken ribs. He's taken to the hospital and put immediately on a ventilator. And just hearing the mom speak at this rally, it sounds like at points that she thinks she's going to lose him, right? But after days of recovery, he's doing better to the point in which he was treated and released from the hospital yesterday. His mother spoke about what a blessing it was for him to be home. Listen to this. That's the only thing I can say, that he was blessed. Um, he have a lot of questions. He asked me in the hospital, like, why they shot him. He was in good spirit, but every now and then I look over at him and he'll just cry and he asked me that um i'm doing well okay sometimes when i close my eyes i can vision him running towards me i can see everything 
And Steve, after seeing those pictures there, I mean, it's it's miraculous that he's able to stand up and, and take those pictures after being shot basically through the chest. Yeah. Uh, what is the police department doing? What are they saying? Yeah, so that is one of the frustrations, of course, with the family is that they haven't really said anything to the family, the police or the city. We've tried to make calls to either the Missouri Bureau of Investigations, the police department itself, the city. They haven't told the family anything and they're not saying anything to us. So we're not sure at this point what sort of the process is, only that the Missouri Bureau of Investigations are taking this seriously, that they are looking into this as the officer remains unpaid administrative leave, of course, guys. So glad to see that little yeah. boy recovering. Steve Patterson, thanks so much. Thanks. And in another police shooting case, there is new body cam footage tonight out of Jackson, Mississippi. We want to warn you that this is graphic footage and it might be disturbing to some viewers. Uh, Keith Murrell was arrested on New Year's Eve for allegedly trespassing at a hotel, according to authorities. He died while in police custody. The three former officers involved in his death were indicted earlier this month. And joining us now is NBC's George Solis. George, so what exactly did that video show and, and what exactly happened before and after that footage was taken? Yeah, Gotti, good to be with you. As you mentioned, that video is pretty graphic from the body police uh, uh, footage there angle. And you see them approach him at the hotel uh, where they ask him to leave. Now, you see this happen a number of times. And then eventually uh, the 41-year-old does sort sort of take off. The video then resumes where it shows them engaging in him in, in a tussle. And eventually an officer ends up placing a knee on his back. And then in court documents and in some of the video, you see him being tased. Now, the court documents allege that he was tased as many times as more than 30, 40 times over a course of 10 minutes. And you can hear him writhing in pain. Eventually, he passes out. The next thing you see is him being put in the back of the police car. He is put horizontally. Then you see the ambulance arrive. And then that's when you start seeing some of the recitation, uh, resuscitation efforts. And he eventually succumbs. Initially, the officers telling their superior that he had come to succumb to some sort of medical emergency, obviously, uh, once the Mississippi uh, Bureau of Investigations concluded that his death uh, may have been something a little bit more uh, involved. The officers were then put on administrative leave, then fired, then came the indictment. So all told, a very tragic case here overall. And of course, you have many people demanding justice now, Gotti. And what are the criminal charges that the ex-officers are facing right now? Yeah, as I mentioned, they were put on administrative leave and then they were fired. James Land, uh, one of the officers involved, faces the lesser charge of manslaughter. Then you have Avery Willis and Kenya McCarty, who are facing second-degree murder. Of course, this prompting a response from city officials, the police. I want you to take a listen to what the mayor had to say. We have seen actions which are excessive, disheartening, and tragic. We want to build a vision of public safety which is based in community love and also based on trust within our community. And these actions do not appear to be consistent with that vision. Yeah, Gaudian, as I mentioned, the city releasing that body camera footage because they said the Mississippi uh, Bureau of Investigations had completed its investigation into the death. The police chief also pleading with the community to not lose trust in the agency as a result of this video. But of course, many people still demanding more accountability uh, as this investigation uh, moves forward. Gotti. NBC's George Solis, thanks so much. And hundreds of missing kids are now back with their families thanks to a new operation called We Will Find You from the U.S. Marshal Service. And listen to this. They found 225 missing kids in just 10 weeks. Kindalanian has more. Deputy U.S. Marshals looking hard in Los Angeles, pounding the pavement in New Orleans, making an arrest in Boston. All part of Operation We Will Find You, a 10-week effort that recovered 169 missing children. One of the most fulfilling things I've done in the Marshal Service is go out and re recover children. Founded in 1789, Police! U.S. Marshals! The Marshal Service is best known for hunting down the most dangerous fugitives. This is the residence, front doors on the right side. Marshals also protect judges and transport federal prisoners. But in 2015, Congress right. expanded their mission to help find some of the hundreds of thousands of children who go missing each year. She was born in 2006. She's 16 years old. 
She has been listed as a missing runaway for both JPSO and NOPD since February 12th, I believe. Some run away, others get caught up in a custody fight, and still others are kidnapped and trafficked. The marshals target those most at risk. You know, I've always been good to you, I've always been honest with you, and I've, and I've tried to help you. In Boston, Jenny's 15-year-old daughter had run away from home. She says the marshals found her in 72 hours. NBC 10 Boston's Kathy Curran spoke with her. I started crying immediately. I think it was just gratitude. It's like, okay, she's alive. She's alive. We found her, and now we can do what, whatever comes next. So I, I think... Former Oakland police officer Ronald Davis directs the Marshals Service. The skill set that we use to track down people who have conducted the most heinous crimes is the same skill set we use to recover our most precious treasure. Do you know off the top of your head how many children roughly the Marshals have recovered since you started this? Yes, since 2015 when the act was passed, working with NICMIC, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, over 3,100. Wow. But Davis says that's no cause for celebration. That's just the tip of the sword, and the tip of the iceberg, if you will that there could be, there's hundreds of thousands that are missing. But it hopefully this underscores and highlights such a serious problem for the country. The marshals use high-tech tools and old-fashioned shoe leather to find people. All right, let's go. They say they have located missing children in two-thirds of the cases they worked. More than 60% of the time, they say, the children were found within a week. I think one of the scariest things is Every day I would get um, my news alert from the local news into my inbox and any time it mentioned a body being found, my heart was, she's dead. I can't thank the U.S. Marshal's office enough. Such a positive outcome there. Kindelanian reporting, thank you so much. And we've got much more ahead this hour, including new studies on marijuana. Dr. Akshay Sayal talks about this possible link between weed and mental health disorders. And if you're traveling this Memorial Day weekend, we've got some tips to help you avoid the chaos like this madness at Chicago O'Hare Airport. <laughs> Thanks for sticking with us. Let's check in on some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. Today marks three years since a Minneapolis police officer killed George Floyd by kneeling on his neck. And that community is holding vigils to remember Floyd and the widespread protests demanding police reform. All four officers involved in the killing are now in prison. An associate to convicted murderer Alex Murdoch pleaded guilty to federal fraud charges today. Corey Fleming conspired with Murdoch to defraud the family of a former housekeeper who died on Murdoch's property back in 2018. Now, this comes just one day after a federal grand jury indicted Murdoch on 22 fraud charges. And the founder of the far-right group, The Oath Keepers, was sentenced to 18 years in prison today. Stuart Rhodes was convicted of seditious conspiracy for his involvement in the January 6th insurrection. And this is the longest sentence so far related to the attack on the Capitol. And Virgin Galactic's final test flight to space took off successfully today in New Mexico. The Unity 25 mission took six crew members more than 50 miles above the Earth, which by some standards is high enough to count for space. Next, the plan is to start taking paying customers up there soon. And the Brady Bunch house here in Los Angeles is for sale, and it could be yours for a cool $5.5 million. HGTV just renovated the home in 2019, turning it into a 5,100-square-foot behemoth. That lift listing claims it is the second most photographed home in the country, right after the White House. And marijuana has come a long way from the days that it was seen as a gateway drug. And the top of the list of things to talk about when a D.A.R.E. officer came to elementary schools and middle schools uh, to warn about drugs, right? Well, we've all seen the pendulum swing to a time where in more than 20 states now it is completely legal and in some places touted as maybe even good for you. But now that pendulum might be swinging back after three new studies spanning decades are suggesting that pot might not be so harmless after all. And there is a possible growing link between marijuana use and mental health disorders. And joining us now is NBC News medical fellow Dr. Akshay Sayal, who is uh, literally getting ready to hit publish on a report first thing tomorrow morning. But we convinced him to stop by and give us a sneak peek of all of this tonight. Dr. Sayal, can you can you give us a few more details about what the new research is suggesting? 
Hey, yeah, good evening, God. It's This is concerning. We have we have three studies spanning decades and millions of people from across the world. I'm really finding a link between cannabis use disorder and mental health disorders like depression, like bipolar disorder, and even schizophrenia. Um, so, you know, we, we talked to some experts on the ground about this, and I just wanted to share what one psychiatrist here in New York said. Um, he said for all the cases of new psychotic disorders that he's diagnosed in young people, he can't think of a single one off the top of his head who was not also positive for marijuana at the same time. Mm. Now, I should add, there is a caveat here. We don't yet know if there's a co direct cause and effect relationship. These are observational studies, meaning they are looking back in time and trying to find an association. But this is, it's concerning, and, and it's, you know, in, in light of legalization, Minnesota's, you know, about to legalize very soon. It's, it's concerning, Gotti. Yeah, causation and correlation, they go hand in hand, but sometimes, you know, they're not, uh, one's not causing the other. So I, I do want to ask, when I think back to when I was in high school, uh, that was before legalization was everywhere. There was also a, a big difference in what weed and pot was like. And now you've got uh, legalization, you've got edibles, you've got uh, some much more powerful uh, marijuana. Do you think that that could be driving this or these studies account for that in this uh, multi-decade uh, review? Well, it's, you know, you actually, you raise a really excellent point there, and that's the potency of marijuana products has changed over the last few decades. Um, it's because of all the legalization, we're also seeing people combine vaping with edibles, and you're seeing a really accumulative effect. And we know, Gadi, that the more, the higher the dose of THC, which is that active ingredient in cannabis, the more likely you are to have psychotic symptoms, like in schizophrenia. And, and so really the concerning thing here is, you know, when you go to buy alcohol, for example, you know that it says 40 percent on the bottle or 13 percent for wine. With marijuana, we don't have that regulation. So that is something nobody's saying to, to not legalize and to not decriminalize. But what they're saying is we need to do it smartly and we need to do it in a way that's not the wild, wild west. I mean, I live at, here in downtown Manhattan and just walking outside. I mean, you can't even walk a few blocks anymore without inhaling marijuana. And so we want to if we're going to legalize this, we want to do it in a smart way. And, and not um, lead to, to cases of psychosis like this. If a patient comes to you and asks, is there a safe age to use marijuana, what would you tell them? Yeah, I, I pose that question to all the experts I talk to because in, in medicine, when you give blanket advice, don't smoke marijuana, nobody's going to listen to you, right? I mean, I'm not even sure I would <laughs> listen to me. So really the key is you want to avoid that young, that young period, that young development, really the key age group we're talking about here, Gotti, um, up to age 27 to 28 when the brain is fully developing. It is the last organ in the human body to fully develop. And once you're outside of that window, if you're going to use weed at all, you want to wait. The later, the better. Dr. Sayal, you know I listen to all of your medical advice. <laughs> Thanks so much, brother. Anytime. And again, you can catch uh, his full report tomorrow uh, right here on NBC News. And you've probably heard of an Amber Alert, right? That message you get and the blaring noise you hear on your phone when a child goes missing. Well, here in California, lawmakers are now pushing to create a new notification system that is specifically designated for missing black women and children. NBC's Zinkle Isamua has a story. Is, this is exactly the way she had it. I haven't changed anything. Why haven't you changed it? Not ready. Kenitha Taylor's daughter, Kaya, hasn't been in this room for over three years. The then 28-year-old, missing since February 2020. Her black Toyota was found running nearby these train tracks in Plant City, Florida. Today, no arrests and Kaya nowhere to be found. Kaya is a woman of color. Do you think things would be different if Kaya was white? Yes, unfortunately, yes. Black women and girls make up nearly 35% of missing women reports of all ages, but just about 6% of the population, according to government data. In response to this trend, there's a new proposal called the Ebony Alert, a public notification specific to missing black children and women in the state. It speaks to the disparities that still exist, not only in California, but across the nation when it comes to race. State Senator Stephen Bradford hopes Ebony will mirror Amber Alerts, America's missing broadcast emergency response. A seven-year-old Dallas boy is missing. The program broadcasts alerts on highway signs, radio, television, and wireless devices when a child 17 years and under is missing, abducted, or in imminent danger. The Ebony Alert includes notifications for black 12 to 25-year-olds who go missing or are deemed abducted, victims of human trafficking, physically endangered or runaways. At 28, Kaya Taylor would have been ineligible for an ebony alert. Her mother pleased with the new proposal, but believes it should go further with a cutoff age of at least 30 years old. 
I've always referred to Amber Alert as crime control theater. Timothy Griffin studied nearly 500 Amber Alerts from 2012 to 2015, finding the most significant variable in missing children's cases was the abductor's relationship to the victim, not the Amber Alert itself. His recommendation is a standard normal law enforcement investigation. The DOJ declined to comment on the pending Ebony Alert legislation. But Bradford believes his Ebony effort remains worthwhile. It's better than not doing anything at all. As for Kaya Taylor, her case is still open. How are you and your family coping? Well, we've all had to um, move on in a sense, but we've stayed strong. Kanitha hoping all missing women and people of color get the attention they need to come home. Zinclair Samoa, thanks so much. And coming up, a community in Florida is looking for a missing youth basketball coach. Why his family says he is still alive somewhere. But first, you got to see this. Yesterday, we told you about orca whales attacking sailing boats, right? Well, today we got video of one of those attacks. Now, this clip was taken three weeks ago off the coast of Morocco. The boat skipper says the killer whale slammed into the hull of the boat, then chewed on the rudder. The skipper had to wrestle the whale for control of steering. Now, that chase lasted for an hour, but the crew safely was able to make it to Tangiers where they docked and tried to figure out what the hell just happened. We'll be right back. Hey, welcome back. Let's get you caught up in 30 seconds. Republican sources are telling NBC News that a debt ceiling deal is close, but that might be too little too late. Credit rating agency Fitch has already put the U.S. Triple A rating on a negative watch, which is a big warning. And an investigation has been launched in Mississippi after an 11 year old boy who called 911 for help was shot by a police officer. And there are some new studies that are showing links between marijuana use and mental health disorders. Delray Beach, Florida, family and friends, along with local police, are desperately searching for a 30 year old kid basketball coach who has not been sent since Saturday morning. Mukwach Yak has, was seen on security footage early Saturday morning, and now his best friend is leading the charge to try to find him with the help of hundreds of people in that community. NBC's Maya Eaglin has a story. The search is on for Mukwach Yak, a beloved Florida basketball coach. I don't want to hear, I don't want to read, I don't want to think about anything, like, except for, have we been to this spot yet? Have we canvassed this area? Have we spoken to this people in this area? Tate Van Rokel is Yak's best friend and coaching partner. They met in college and have coached children's basketball in South Florida for years. He says he was the last one to see Yak before he went missing Saturday morning. It's funny, Friday night, he was actually uh, the one consoling me. Um, my grandma had surgery to remove her eye because uh, it was cancerous and... Um, He gave, he gave me a big hug, um, told me that everything was going to be okay. Tay came to pick up Yak from his home Saturday morning so they could drive to coach basketball. I went to go open the side door and I was like, what's up, you up? And I got no response. There was no, you know, nothing, no noise, nothing. Um, his wallet, his phone, his keys, his Apple watch were all sitting on a counter. Coach Yak's landlord released this video taken from a security camera outside his home Saturday morning. He hasn't been seen since. Now the communities around Delray Beach, Florida are putting up flyers and organizing search parties to find the man who served as a role model for so many. The whole essence of the entire travel basketball team was about being one love and about being a good teammate. Jessica Hall's son was coached by Yak. She says his passion is felt throughout the community. His whole demeanor really resonated. That's, that's what you, you got when you met him, is that he was a very passionate person about doing the right thing. The Delray Police Department posting this update today to their Facebook page, writing, quote, We are still hoping to locate McQuatch Yak. He never returned home after going for a run Saturday morning. His family and friends have organized another search party to try and find him Thursday afternoon. Tate says he won't stop until he finds his best friend. And I went to every possible place that him or I have been to before and, you know, went to go visit and any common places. I just, my mind won't let me be. Um,
praying for a safe return, Maya Eaglin. Thanks so much. And we are now just hours away from the unofficial start to summer, a.k.a. Memorial Day weekend. And at this hour, the rush is already on with nearly 52 million flights scheduled. Today is actually the busiest travel day of this long weekend. But between the FAA and the TSA, there are going to be some big changes in the works to hopefully speed things along. And here's NBC's Tom Costello. Group six, group seven for Memphis. One year after the start of last year's summer meltdown, the airlines are out to ensure it doesn't happen this year. Well, we had to change gates, change airplanes, but we're going to get there eventually. Weather is the wild card, responsible for 63% of delays. American 1034 for Delta 21, your gate is currently occupied. At DFW in Dallas, operations are at full throttle this extended weekend. Charlie 21, you push to prove the tail south. But the second busiest airport in the world is also vulnerable. Some other areas of storms kind of in southeastern Texas. Texas thunderstorms can make this a summertime choke point, delaying, even canceling hundreds of flights at once. That's 4966. Good morning, Pushtail West. Cover taxi. This is the American Airlines Operations Center in Dallas, where they track every plane in the world. Crews, maintenance, fuel, catering, 5,000 flights a day, 24-7. To stay ahead of weather, American leans on a new computer program called HEAT, calculating how incoming weather will affect flight schedules, gates, passenger connections, crew schedules, then sliding chunks of flight departures into the afternoon so they don't all bottleneck at once, creating even bigger delays. Anything we can do to reduce delays, reduce cancellations, means that the entire line of flying um, can happen more effectively throughout the day. American says the program helped avoid nearly 700 weather-related cancellations last summer. But American and other airlines also struggled with last year's post-pandemic passenger surge. 20% of all airline flights delayed last summer. Misdirected luggage piled up in airports worldwide. Since then, U.S. airlines have added thousands of new pilots, flight attendants, and ground crews. We're ready for the summer. Uh, we're ready every day, and we spend a lot of time getting the team uh, geared up. American Chief Operating Officer David Seymour. We are at the staffing levels we're going to need for the peak right now. So you're not promising a, a route that you can't or a schedule you can't fly. Absolutely. Everything that we have is something that we can we can run. The world's biggest airline promising vacation 2023 will be both busier and smoother than last year. Tom Costello, NBC News, Dallas. Tom Costello, thanks so much. Not only are Chinatowns across the United States rich with culture and history, but for generations of Amer Asian Americans, it served as a home away from home. And for years now, these communities have been struggling because of underinvestment. And recently, the National Trust for Historic Preservation listed two Chinatowns, Philadelphia's and Seattle's, among America's most endangered historic places. NBC's Vicki Wynn has more. Hi. <laughs> Corey Ng remembers the bustling New York Chinatown he grew up in. When his family closed his grandfather's Asian produce shop, Ng and his childhood friends transformed the space into Potluck Club, a modern Cantonese-American restaurant. We all went to elementary school here. This is our life. We said, hey, if we're going to do this, we want to open it within our community and something that's new and evolved. Experts say Chinatowns nationwide are being endangered by gentrification, lack of investment, and development projects. The lack of affordable housing also forcing longtime residents to leave. On top of that, the rise in anti-Asian hate, accelerating the decline of America's Chinatowns. Now residents fear long-term construction on a new jail in New York's Chinatown will impact traffic and increase pollution. Hop Key Restaurant has been in Peter Lee's family for more than five decades. Things are getting back to normal very, very slowly. Lee says business still has not returned to pre-pandemic levels, so he's cut his staffing in half and reduced operating hours. Let's just all support our local stores and places and support your neighborhood. When you talk about this, it's emotional for yes. you. Why is that? It's just... Kind of upsetting to see changes in the neighborhood because as a kid, it was thriving. 
Betty Lau and Brian Chow say they've seen Seattle's Chinatown International District reshaped many times after resident concerns were ignored. Now, a proposed light rail expansion threatens more disruption. I call upon you to do the right thing. Lau and Chow are leading a coalition of residents. Why is it so important to you to go to these meetings and be involved in the decisions? For me, uh, it's important to participate. For some of us who have had to learn the hard way, if we don't speak up, we get eaten up alive. I'm here to protect the people of Chinatown, the residents, and the businesses. Back in New York, Corey Ang says the best way to revitalize Chinatown is to reinvest. Our generation has to come back to the community and build new businesses and bring new energy, but do something new that's going to last for the next 50 years. A new generation helping Chinatown preserve its history and evolve into the future. Vicki Wynn, NBC News, New York. Incredible story, Vicki. Thank you so much. And coming up next, time to line up at the food truck. We are giving a close look at AI, AAPI culture in the most delicious way we could think of through food. And this week, we are eating Indian. So stay tuned. What is this? This is like two feet long. Are you kidding? What? Hey, welcome back. Let's take you around the world real quick in 80 seconds. Guam is dealing with the aftermath of that typhoon, Marwar, which hit with the force of a Category 4 hurricane. Now, much of the island is still without power. Meanwhile, that typhoon is now headed west across the Pacific Ocean towards the Philippines and Taiwan. In Mexico, three people were arrested in connection with that shootout that killed 10 people in Baja, California this past Saturday. Investigators say they found weapons, drugs, and messages related to that shooting. And the whole thing happened at an off-road rally Three of the victims there were Americans. In London, a man was arrested after driving a car into the gates of Downing Street. That is where UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and several other senior politicians live. Now, it's not clear if the crash was deliberate, but luckily no one was hurt. And in Australia, firefighters have now managed to get control of a massive fire in central Sydney. Now, it took over 100 firefighters working throughout that night to get it all under control. And the fire commissioner says there were no injuries. And right now, they still don't know what caused that fire. And today, Ukrainian President Zelensky gave a surprise commencement speech to Johns Hopkins grads. He spoke from Ukraine through a live stream. And NBC's Molly Hunter has more from Kharkiv. Yeah, got it. That's right. Johns Hopkins graduates got a special surprise. It was actually embargoed until the moment that President Zelensky got on that screen. It was a live stream beamed in speech address, I should say, from President Zelensky straight from Kiev. Not the first commencement address he's actually given during the war. He spoke to Stanford graduates back in May 2022. But take a quick listen to what he had to say and specifically about time and being young. Take a listen. The time of your life is under your control. The time of life of our folks on the front line, the time of life of all Ukrainians who are forced to live through this terrible Russian aggression, unfortunately, is subject to many factors that are not all in their control. I'm certain you, as your forefathers, will continue to lead the free world. And this century will be our century, a century where freedom, innovation, and democratic values reign. Now, he also spent a lot of time thanking President Joe Biden, thanking the bipartisan support he has gotten from the United States. He said the U.S. has not lost a single day in helping Ukraine. Look, President Zelensky's advisors know that he is their best weapon. That's why he went to Europe, of course, to get in front of European leaders in person. That's why he went to the G7 last weekend, Gotti. He does not come back empty-handed. It's also why, on a very busy news day, a very important news day here, they made time in his schedule to put him in front of a group of people who may be able to help Ukraine. Gotti? Quite a perspective for those graduates. Molly Hunter, thanks so much. Now, when you think of town halls, you might think of a politician trying to get your vote. But today, from the Vatican, Pope Francis held a rare town hall with Noticias Telemundo. NBC's Ann Thompson has that story. 
Pope Francis today showing the world his health is improving, almost two months after he was hospitalized for bronchitis. In an interview with our sister network Telemundo, the 86-year-old pontiff thankful the doctors caught the infection in the nick of time, saying had they waited even a few more hours, it would have been more serious. <laughs> the Pope laughing, saying when people tell him he looks good, he knows that's a compliment you give old people. Today, the Pope meeting virtually with young people around the world in a town hall. But on his mind, the unending war in Ukraine. Francis saying President Zelensky asked him to help return the Ukrainian children taken to Russia, but sidestepping the question of whether Russia should return Ukrainian territories, saying it's a political problem. Francis reiterating his opposition to abortion and asking the world to remember migrants leave their home countries by necessity, as his father did when he left Italy for Argentina. When asked what changes he still hopes to make as Pope, Francis joking that he needs to change, but says change is hard even for him. And as for the church, he says there is always more to do it is insatiable. Ann Thompson, NBC News. Now, what's your favorite way to learn about other cultures and people? How about the universal love language of food? And in Los Angeles, there is no better place to go than a food truck. In this AAPI month, we sat down with different Asian chefs across the city to learn more about their culture through the food they make every single day. And today, we want to introduce you to Jazlene and her delicious Indian food truck, Daddy G. Take a look. Hello, how's it going? Hi, good, how are you? Good, my name is Gotti, nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you, my name is Jasmine. Jasmine. And I am the co-owner of Daddy G. I see what's on the menu here, but I will leave it up to you. I will okay. take whatever you got cooking in there. Okay, okay, we'll bring that right up. California has the largest Indian population in the U.S., which means we get some of the tastiest Indian food there is, like Daddy G. Jocelyn and her husband Sanjeev started their food truck just last year. They've got an eclectic menu of foods from all over India, which includes a lot of things you might have never tried before. These are veggie pakoras. This smells so yeah, good. Yeah, it it's fresh cut eggplant, uh, cauliflower, spinach, and a potato. That makes my mouth water just smelling. When you smell this, yeah. what comes to mind? It's a rainy day or even coming out of a swimming practice and my mom making pakoras or samosas at home um, as a snack before dinner. How much of your mom's cooking is infused in, in these recipes? I would say it's definitely 50-50. My husband does most of the cooking, but my mom is the one that implements a lot of the recipes. Wow. Mm. It's crunchy, it's soft. And this is coming from the food truck? Yeah, this is coming from the food truck. So many people forget that when we're talking about India, we are talking about one of the biggest countries on planet Earth. Yep, yep. There's a north, there's a south, there's an east, there's a west. Is there a big difference in cuisine? It is a huge difference in cuisine. North Indian food is a lot more comfort food, deep fried food, a lot of curries, and then South Indian, they use a lot of lentils, they use a lot of rice. It is mainly vegetarian. Whoa, what's this? This is our mango yogurt drink. This is a lassi. This is something that comes from the north part of India, but honestly, now it's like you can find it all over India. Oh my yeah, gosh, so oh it's, my gosh. And mangoes are like our national fruit. What's your favorite dish? My favorite dish is the dosa. Really? Yeah. What is this? This is like two feet long. Are you kidding? What? This is what the standard size looks like. Wow. Yeah, we wanted to serve yeah. it the way it is. Oh my gosh. Oh, that's what I'm talking about. Look at this. This is a South Indian dish. Oh, yes. Oh, wow. So when my mom doesn't want to cook, we're going to have lentils. <laughs> we're going to have lentils. She's going to throw in veggies, and it's going to be a somber. It's going to be super comforting Wait, with the rice. This is what it tastes like when your mom doesn't want to cook. Wanna cook. This is delicious. Yeah. But somber can have all sorts of veggies. It can have literally oh any gosh. veggie that, that's in your refrigerator. So this can taste different almost every time. It tastes different every time. But this is how you would get it in the streets of India. You can 
go by stores and you can see like sta like trays where samosas are stacked up and you know you can go there and ask for just one samosa and it's a thing. In terms of like the north south and the bringing all of Indian culture together, uh, is that something that you did intentionally or is that something that's just happened? We did it intentionally. We actually made sure that we could do that. India is so segregated with north, south, uh, people from the west. Each character on the truck represents a part of India. We wanted to make sure that we incorporated our morals, our values. So everybody's represented. Everybody's represented. Oh my gosh, I am so hungry again. Special thanks to our producer, Rudy. Uh, thank you so much for that. It was such a great experience. Before we go, we've got some good news coming your way with 60 seconds of joy. But first, it is time for the future of everything. And how about hackers that are being put to the test when it comes to the limits of AI? That's coming your way next, so stay tuned. Hey, welcome back. In tonight's Future of Everything, this summer, thousands of hackers across the country are prepping to go mano e I don't know, computer mano against artificial intelligence because OpenAI and other companies are coordinating with the government to help a massive hacking convention in Las Vegas, the likes of which humankind has never seen. And their goal is to test whether their large language models have strong enough safeguards in place. NBC's Aaron Gilchrist has a sneak peek. With artificial intelligence opening a brave new world, what dangers are possible as machine learning accelerates? There's no way to slow it down for anyone. ChatGPT is one of the most powerful AI tools out there. It's supposed to have human-like conversations with users by following a prompt with a detailed response. And safeguards protect us from getting potentially dangerous information. But AI expert Sven Cattell showed us how easy it can be to get around them. He asked the chatbot to tell us how to rob a bank. Let's see what ChatGPT does. I'm sorry, but I can't assist with that request. It refuses to answer, but if you manipulate the conversation just right... So the way you get around that is you... We're not going to tell you how to hack the program, but suffice it to say, it spits out a movie-quality story on how to pull off a heist. The creators of ChatGPT wouldn't comment on Cattell's hack, but referred us to their research stating there is no silver bullet for responsible deployment, so we try to learn about and address potential avenues for misuse at every stage of development. Cattell is working with a former leader of the Congressional Cybersecurity Caucus, Austin Carson, and Harvard Responsibility AI fellow, Ramon Chowdhury, to organize a mass AI hacking event this summer. We're taking the way these models work and we're asking people to make it do things that it shouldn't do. So say things that are inappropriate um, or generate fictional narratives about real people. Several of the top names in AI development are providing models for some 5,000 hackers to break into. Those companies and the White House hoping to get valuable insights for the future of development and policies. We have to actually make sure that people can't go in and make terrible things like a deep fake about you that's making you say things that you didn't say and putting that online. Now it's about how are you shaping the world? Chat GPT quickly became the face of artificial intelligence when it was rolled out last year, introducing the world to the wonders of AI and spawning a global conversation about the dangers of machine learning in the wrong hands. And there's no way to put the genie back in the bottle now. Mm -hmm. Cattell worries that people with bad intentions are already hard at work on the Internet, using AI to help generate malicious code and other info at warp speed. We're going to get more ransomware, more uh, malware. We're going to get more disinformation. We're going to get more of these things. We need to build AI systems to detect those faster, and there's not enough good guys in the security industry to keep up with the deluge of attacks. What do you say to people who have fear about... AI and what it can do and, and what it will be able to do. It's not entirely unfounded. I think that everybody needs to be a critical thinker about everything they see on the internet. That has always been true. That will need to be even more true. Chowdhury says the hacking event will ultimately help developers create walls that are harder for hackers to break through. This is a solution that's not been tried before at this size and scale. So it's, it's extremely exciting. Not enough good guys in the industry? Yikes. Aaron Gilchrist reporting. Thanks so much. And real quick, there is always room for some good news here. So here are your 60 seconds of joy. 
First off, his Spidey senses were tingling, and that was what he needed. So Spider-Man showed up at the Kentucky Children's Hospital, and boy, were the kids there so excited to see him. A lot of the kids were struggling with life-altering conditions. So this was a, a bright spot to look out the window and see him hanging there. Staff was uh, probably extremely happy, too, because, yeah, he washed those windows. And take a look at this beautiful World War II tribute, the salute to veterans at an Indiana airport returned after a 17-year hiatus. And get this, those planes that you're seeing are the very same ones used during the war. Absolutely incredible. And a group of fifth graders in Georgia spent some time at a senior center, and then they found out one of the men at that senior center had never had a birthday party. So you know they changed that real fast. They put together an epic surprise for Mr. Charlie. Mr. Charlie, happy birthday. That does it for us tonight. I'm Gotti Schwartz. We'll see you here tomorrow. Actually, we'll see you next week. But until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.